working prototype, which we would show to a customer. And the idea was to get feedback. Do you want such an application? Does it make sense to build it? And out of many, many prototypes which we built, only two of them uh, are now products, or they are in work of becoming products. One is uh, based on the SAP cloud platform, and the other one is a standalone add-on component. But we had fun. We learned everything from, from Java, from we did HANA, we did UI5, we did machine learning, we tried out everything, and it was really cool. But in the end, my idea, and nowadays I work as an independent consultant, is how to get this feedback cycle shorter, how not to waste two months on, on uh, learning a technology and then just build a prototype and throw it away. So the full title of my presentation is make sure you are building the right it before you build it right. And I don't know if you are fans of mindfulness. I just have a short exercise. I know it's late, especially being the last presentation. But I want you to think, just close your eyes and breathe slowly and think just for a few seconds, how would you uh, make sure you are building the right application? So everybody here has something to do with SAP development, either you are developers or consultants or architects, but in the end you are building something. And how do you make sure that the stuff you are building, the it, is really something that your customers or end users, we call them customers, but I it can be in the same organization or you can sell it as a product, but how do you make sure that this is what people actually want and would buy in the end? So please close your eyes and think for this for two seconds and just try to keep it in mind because at the end of the presentation I'm, I'm really curious about your feedback, if it matches what uh, I found researching these topics. Okay, so what is the right it? So here it, I call it it, you will see a bit later on why I, I call it it. It's the, a product, a software, an application, a book maybe that you want to do, or any kind of, of thing that doesn't exist and you would like to bring it to reality, but you know that it will take uh, a lot of effort, maybe time, money, dedication, and you want to be sure that it's something that people will want, that it makes sense to build it. And the best acronyms for it are idea to test, it's a good one, and my favorite is innovation to try. So this is especially in the, in the sense of, of a bit late adopters uh, in enterprise software where the technologies are there but you want to see if they make sense and you can bring them in. And why? So why is it important to build the right it? And here I have two statistics which maybe it's uh, not a surprise for you but 90% of mobile apps don't make any money. So you have to think a bit that the Play Store, the App Store are full of apps, but they don't make money. But behind them, there are many developers who spend hours, uh, days, months to build them. A lot of dedication, a lot of effort, but in the end, they nobody buys it or nobody uses the application. Or four out of five startups actually lose money for their investors. Now, I don't mean to discourage you, and I guess you know that the odds are uh, heavily stacked against you if you want to start uh, to build something. But this is the point of this presentation, how you can, or what tools you can use to identify this or get feedback early. So by definition, if you don't have the right it, then you must have the wrong it. And this is one of the most wasteful things you can do is invest time in building something. You get already some feedback. It's maybe not what people want, but you think that if you work harder and you do it the best thing you can do, it will eventually become a successful product. So this sometimes might be the case, but in general it's not, and it's a bad idea to, to move on doing this. So how do you make sure you're building the right it? And here I have a, a short story. It's called the IBM speech to text. So the IBM speech to text was product, let's say, which was developed in the 80s or 70s. I was not born, so I don't know. <laughs> and uh, the idea was that back then, uh, People were not used to typing, so not many people would know how to use a computer. Most people who would be able to type really fast like we do nowadays were only secretaries, programmers and writers. And IBM was at the time the best positioned company to build such a product, speech to text, because they had two big lines of business. One was their typewriters and the other one was their mainframe computers. 
So they were ideally there and they had the idea and they started talking to customers and say, okay, we would like to build this product. Is this something you would like? And everybody was cheering, yeah, this is, of course we want it, we don't like. Many people were, were typing like this and yeah, we, we would like such a product and for sure we will buy it. So IBM had the money, had the know-how and they could invest and build such a product at the time. But luckily enough, some people working at IBM were not convinced that this is something that actually people would like to buy and would actually need. So what they did is made an experiment. They got together some of the people who said, yeah, for sure we would buy this product. They got them in the room and they said, yeah, we built the first version of the product and we would like, we chosen you to test it and give us a feedback. And they put in front of them a monitor and a microphone, but as you see, no keyboard. And they said, you have for today to try out the product. And as they were speaking, magically, the text was appearing on the screen with little to no error. But there was a problem. By the end of the day, the people who were really convinced they would buy this product, they kind of changed their minds. So first of all, this would create a really loud, noisy work environment. If you imagine in an office, everybody talking to their computers. Second, if you talk all day, your throat gets sore. So this And third, it was really a problem with uh, any kind of confidential data. So what do you do? You take your computer and go in the corner and it will not work. And then at the end of the day, they decided, yeah, maybe this is not something we actually want. And it's easier to teach people to use the keyboards. And luckily, IBM didn't invest. It would have taken a lot of time and money uh, 30, 40 years ago to build such a technology. They actually call this an experiment because what they did is that in the room next door, they had a really skilled uh, typist who was listening to what the people were saying and typing it really fast on the computer. So this gave IBM the chance that in one day, they figure out this is the wrong product. So back then, IBM was bigger than today and probably they could recover from uh, a failure that would have been this product, but luckily they managed to avoid this. So one question for you is how many people here think that this is a prototype? Could you please raise a hand? Okay, and for the other ones, uh, what else would you call it if it's not a prototype? Fake, okay, an experiment. So here is the thing, is when you uh, try to apply this in your organization and you go to your managers and say, hey, I need budget for my next experiment. Your answer will probably be, yeah, okay, <laughs> we will see. So a good term for this, which I found online, it doesn't come for me, it's called pretotyping. And there is a, even a website called pretotyping.org. So it's not a spelling mistake, it's pretotyping. Because what they did was, actually they didn't build anything. They just, as you said, faked it. So you cannot really call it a prototype. So pretotype. And it has a really nice definition. Pretotyping is the art and science of faking it before making it. <laughs> so as a disclaimer, this is the it. Uh, most of this content comes from these three books, which are really great and I uh, definitely recommend. So the first two are written by Alberto Savoia. This is a former Google engineer and I think the one who uh, was the brain behind the Adware and AdSense, the first to make money for Google. And this prototype it is actually free. You can find it on Google and download it as a PDF. The write it and of course the Lean Startup by Eric Ries, you can find on Amazon and they are really worth it. So prototyping, the art and science of faking it before making it. But we heard that a lot of people think this is a prototype. So what is the difference between a prototype and a prototype? The, the, the simple uh, answer is there are different questions that uh, these two terms answer. So prototyping answers, can we build it? And in the case of IBM back then, probably they could build it. Will it work as expected? Mm, as we see, not even today, the technology with uh, speech to text is not really there as you would expect it. How much would it cost? So 40 years ago, it would have cost a lot to build such a thing. While prototyping, oh, and fa how fast can we make it? So this is also uh, a thing for prototyping that you helps you estimate how fast would it take to build something. While prototyping answers only one simple question. Is this the right thing to build? Does it make sense to do it? And of course, when the answer is yes, then you go from prototyping to prototyping. 
Another key difference is that prototyping normally takes days, weeks, and months. This I tell you from my experience, it took months. <coughs> While prototyping should normally take minutes, hours, and or maximum days. So the prototype IBM made didn't take much to prepare, but it uh, proved to be a really, really good idea to validate the, the idea. <laughs> Okay, and I'm a big fan of, of Dilbert cartoons from Adam Scott. <laughs> so what's the idea here? It's maybe this one you know, it's try, try again, try again, try again, try again, and maybe, it's not guaranteed, you succeed. So this is a simple concept, but really, really effective, which is called fail fast, fail often. And now it's very popular among software developers, but it's nothing new. So uh, from prototyping, we also have the law of failure. So again, prototyping.org. And the law of failure says that most new its, and by its is software, product, book, whatever, will fail even if they are flawlessly executed. And by most, it's 70 to 90%. So there is a lot of failure out there. And the idea is how can you, you shorten this period until you find out that it's actually a fail. So achieving failure, if you're building something nobody wants, it doesn't matter if we accomplish it on time, on budget, with high quality, and with a beautiful design in the case of a UI5 Fiori application. In the end, nobody will use it. So we could say that achieving failure is the same as successfully executing a bad plan. So how do you achieve failure? Let's say we have an idea. And we have three ways to fail. The first one is to do nothing with our idea. This is really simple, and we failed. 100% guaranteed. Second one is we go for it. So we do fall in, we get a budget, we start building something and we will see later on if it made sense or not. So we take a lot of risk. And the third one is we give it a try. So give it a try, it's obviously the prototyping part. But again, what is with this go for it? And here, we have the evil twin of prototyping, which is called product typing. And what is product typing? By definition, it means build it right, even if you are not sure you are building the right it. And product typing, is unfortunately the way most new products are developed and is the, way, uh, is the reason why most failures are so slow, painful and expensive. So here you can think of the best example, which is the Google Plus, which they just killed a few weeks ago after years and years of, of carrying it, dragging it around. So product typing is a bad idea. It's better to prototype it. So how do you prototype something? And here, from the books of Alberto Savoia, I extracted some prototyping techniques, which I think are really effective and really relevant in terms of SAP development. And I want to share them with you. And the first one is called the Mechanical Turk. So what is the Mechanical Turk? The idea is to replace <coughs> complex and expensive computers or machines with human beings. So here you can, the best example is the IBM one. But the term mechanical uh, Turk actually comes from the 18th century, from the Austrian Empire, where somebody devised this machine, which they said it's a chess playing autonom, but in reality, it was just a mannequin with a really skilled, tiny chess player hidden inside. And this they showcased around the empire, and people were thinking they play with an uh, actual robot. And I really like this. There is a service from Amazon called Mechanical Turk, mturk.com. <laughs> And I love this uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. So this one is really useful and uh, quite cheap. It's a, a service to prove ideas. So imagine you want to build some kind of chatbot, for example. But you don't want to invest in the technology. Okay, some will say, yeah, it's really easy now. You have uh, Amazon Lex or the Recast AI and so on. But still, you have to do some investment. You have to build something. While you could go to this service, and here there are people who register to become the, the tiny chess player, and they will do it for you, in, like in the case of IBM. And this will help you prove ideas. So, Mechanical Turk. The second one, it's called the Pinocchio. So what is the Pinocchio? The Pinocchio, the idea is to build a non-function, lifeless version of the product. 
So here it's making something like a clickable <laughs> mockup. And of course, SAP gives us a really nice tool for this called SAP Build. I'm sure you know it. If not, I'm happy that you find out about it from me. And you have to go to build.me. It's a free tool, up to five prototypes you can build. And I don't show you a demo, but I did steal a YouTube video about it. It's an uh, older version, but you, you will get the idea. So here, somebody made uh, some either paper mockups or whiteboard mockups of a new app that you would like to build. And the tool is really easy. It's web-based. You go here, you import the, your pictures. You can rearrange them as you want. So this is some kind of work list application. And for paper or this kind of mockups, you can make these hotspots. So you can actually make it clickable in only a, a few seconds. So this video is like one minute. And uh, here they build this small app. Of course, you still need the design thinking workshop and to, to generate the first idea of the application. But then to make the first clickable mockup that you can immediately send to, to the end users or to the customer to get feedback, it's really easy. So you see now he can already start navigating and play around with this app. And another nice feature which is offered by Build is the possibility to create a study. So what this means, you can validate your design. <laughs> it generates a URL to your application. And this one you can already send to, to the end users that they can actually try clicking around and get an impression how will it be working with the app. And it's really nice that it offers you even a, a heat map that you can see, you can give tasks. So you can send a link and say, hey, this is the new uh, app. Please add this order to the, to the chart. And then you can see how they clicked around and where did they look for the buttons. So you can improve the usability. So this is build.me. It's a really nice tool for building Pinocchios. But while researching for this presentation, I found something even cooler, which I think will be the future. And I have another video. So this first as an introduction, this is a small innovation startup from Romania, my home country. And when I saw this the first time, I said, this is amazing. And I wrote the, the CEO, I found him on LinkedIn and I wrote him, hey, this is really cool. Uh, can you give me some more info about it? And can I use your video? And he said, yes, of course. And I, I want to share this with you. So what is happening here is they use machine learning <coughs> to analyze what this guy is drawing on the whiteboard and is generating uh, HTML coding. <coughs> so this is fully responsive. Uh, it's there. You just draw it and you can uh, click on it and work with it. Now this one is, is not uh, UI5, it's React, but the idea is that you could generate a UI5 application out of it. It's still generated code, so you will have to alter it a bit, but to to prove the idea, to, to give a feeling already to the, to the end user, this is really great. So this is called Teleport HQ. You can find them on teleporthq.io. And this idea is called Think to Code. Now, in my opinion, this is not really Think to Code. This is more like Draw to Code or Draw Code. But still, uh, it's, it's really cool, and I think this will be the future of, of making prototypes in this uh, manner. So the Pinocchio. The third one, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, it's called the Minimum Viable Product, or the MVP. And here, the idea is to create a functional version of it, but you strip it down to the most basic functionality. And here we have this nice quote from Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn that if you are not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. So this means that in the case of LinkedIn, it was a success, but if it wouldn't have been, they would have spent a little more time than needed uh, building this. And I think you also know this picture. So what, what is this? This is the MVP concept. So you build a minimum viable product. So let's say we have a team and we are doing a Scrum or Agile approach and we have a customer who wants a car. So what do we do? We have the first, we have a sprint, we start building, and at the end of the first sprint, we have a bunch of wheels. We are really proud, we take them and ship them to the customer. So the first increment, it's there. And what does the customer do? He gets the wheels, say, okay, they are really nice wheels, but what am I supposed to do with them? I cannot use them in any way. We say, okay, thanks for the feedback. We go back into the laboratory, work hard, another sprint, we build a chassis, 
ship it to the customer. The customer says, yeah, this is nice, but I still cannot use it. It doesn't, do, it doesn't get the job done. Okay, thanks for the, the next round of feedback. We go back, we work a bit more, and we finally complete the car, and we ship it to our customer. In which case, the customer says, that's great. This is, why couldn't you do this from the beginning? So is this uh, MVP? Not really. Because you, don't, you get feedback, but it's not valuable feedback. The customer cannot use this, the end user cannot use this application. It's okay, the wheels are a function, but it's not everything you need. So it's not like you build an MVP, you actually build it like this. So here the idea is you don't focus on what the customer wants, because the customer usually doesn't know what they want. They have an idea, but they are not sure. But you focus on the problem. And the problem is, or what they want to do, is to get from point A to point B. And the easiest way is to build a bicycle and ship it to the customer. The customer uses the bicycle, gets from point A to point B. So you have a happy customer. But they would like to get faster from point A to point B. Valuable feedback. You go back and you, put a, you strap a, an engine to the bicycle and it becomes a motorcycle. And then the customer can go from point A to point B faster. So you have a happier customer. And finally, the customer says, okay, we, I want to go from point A to point B, but maybe I want to take some, uh, something else with me or some other people with me. In which case, you expand a bit the motorcycle and you have a car, and then the customer can go from point A to point B fast with the luggage or whatever, and you have the happiest customer. So this is the way you build an MVP. So the minimum viable product. Another issue here is that you have this uh, pyramid. And most of the time when you build an MVP, you only focus on this functional, which gives you some feedback, but most of the time some customers, mm, you lose them on the long term. You still build it and build it, but you, they never have it in the end, or they don't have something that they would like. And in my opinion, this is wrong. The way something like this should be built is more towards an emotional design. Even if it doesn't get the job done, like the bicycle, they can still try it and uh, get an, a feeling, okay, maybe I like the bicycle and I actually don't need a car in the end, which would also be uh, a plus for the customer. And this one, it's called a minimum lovable product. So maybe you know this term as well. So MLP. And we have another uh, nice <coughs> quote. This one is from Eric Ries from the Lean Startup book. And the idea here of the, he calls it MVP, I call it MLP, but the idea at the end is to collect the maximum amount of validated feedback. So feedback <coughs> that has value about uh, the customer with the least amount of effort. So the minimum lovable product. The fourth technique is called the provincial. So what is the provincial? The idea here is, before you launch something worldwide, and here worldwide is in italic because it can be anything. It can be an uh, app literally worldwide. It can be something within your organization. You could also call it worldwide, and so on and so forth. The idea here is to test this on a small sample before you ship it to everybody. So this can be, especially if you build something around SAP software, especially around ERP, you have all these company codes, different legislation, different small modifications for each country. So if you build a new app, you can start and build it only for one group and forget about all the other stuff because it's noise, you don't need it. And you can also apply this provincial on your feature list. So you can forget about internationalization. You don't have to translate the text, you try it on a small group. If you build a mobile app, you can do either Android or iOS. It doesn't make sense to build both if you don't know if people will actually want the application. Or Windows Phone. Or Windows Phone. <laughs> 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 so the provincial. The fifth uh, prototyping technique it's called the fake door. So what is the fake door? Here, the idea is to create a fake entry for a product, but in my opinion, it works best for features that does not exist. So what you want to do here is you build a fake dummy button and you want to see if people actually click on it. Will they ever want this kind of thing? So I was thinking always what is a good example for, for this kind of feature uh, around the SAP context, and the best thing I would think of is the user assistant. If you worked with a user assistant in the Fiori uh, client, you have this navigation through the app where you can press, okay, I need help, and it shows you, okay, you have to type here and press and press and press. And if you build a custom app, 
Unfortunately, SAP doesn't give yet the tools that you can adapt uh, this one or you can build your own, but there are other frameworks online that you can use to build such a, a navigation, and there is a, an even nice one on OpenUI5. But the idea is, do you need this thing? Will actually somebody need this help? It takes a lot of effort to build it. So you can just put the help button there and count how many people uh, click on it. Do they really need this feature or not? So the fake door. The sixth technique, it's called the pretend to own. So this is the final technique, and here the idea is that some its or some products require a major upfront investment. So you have to buy servers, you have to buy licenses, you have to buy cloud. It's a lot of investment, but you're not sure if you really need it or not. And here the best thing is to borrow or rent it, but pretend that you own it. And here SAP is really nice and <laughs> offers a cloud trial. So you can basically try everything, build the prototypes, show them to customers, and then if they actually need it, you can go and buy the license. So cloudplatform.sap.com. So here, the punchline is to be a cheapskate until you know you have the right it. So don't throw away money, don't buy te technology which you don't need in the end. So these are the six prototyping techniques. But the question is, you have the, okay. <laughs> Fast pitch. Okay, are there any ethical considerations in this case? So. First question is, is it right to build this fake door just to see if people click on it? Are you not lying to your users? And in the end, you are in, in some degree lying to your users. But think about of how many products you bought, you use them once or twice, and then you ever regret it that you bought, bought it. So maybe it was not the best idea. In this case, you have to think about all the effort that goes into developing a feature, the hours the developer spends into building an app, and then nobody uses it. So it's better to fake it and uh, see if actually somebody wants something like this. So how do you do it? You test it. Because of course, data beats opinions. And here we have the example of IBM, where everybody said that they want it, so they could have went uh, on and built it, but they collected some data, they tested it, and they saw, okay, actually people don't want such a thing. And there are two metrics to collect. First one, it's really simple, it's called an initial level of interest, <coughs> or ILI. And this one has a simple formula. It's the number of actions taken divided by the number of opportunities for action offered. So how many people saw your button? How many people clicked on it? Does it make sense to build it or not? And in some degrees, this is the only metric you need. So if you want to write a book, you can put a, a link. Hey, this is my book. Click to download. And if nobody downloads it, maybe it doesn't make sense to spend the time to write it. If a lot of people click on it, maybe it's a good idea. But in some cases, this is not enough. So if you have something which is based on repetitive business, you want people to come back and use it, then there is another metric called the ongoing level of interest, or OLI, which is described by a time-based graph or a table. And here we have three situations. So here you have the level of interest over a period of time. And in the so first example, initially there is a lot of interest. You launch an app, people use it a bit, but over time, less and less people uh, use this thing. So this, you have then an acceptance level. So this is a level where you think, okay, what is underneath this makes no sense to build. Even if the initial level, it doesn't go over this line, the effort is too high, there is no benefit of it. In this case, it goes high, but you want to see it over a period of time. Do people actually want it or not? The second example is you have an, in an initial spike, and then less people use it, but still in the end there is a base, so it makes maybe sense or not. This, base this acceptance level has no number, it's up, up to you. And the third one is of course, interest gets high and keeps going and going, in which case for sure uh, it makes sense to go ahead and do it. So the idea here is to look for a trend. So you have to try it, and as a short summary, I hope that you know now what prototyping is, and it's not a misspelling. Why is it important? What are some of the techniques? So this provincial fake door and so on. And what data to collect and what metrics to use. So uh, one last thing, think big, start small, learn fast. And there is a prototyping manifesto. So the idea is that innovators beat ideas, prototypes beat product types, of course, doing beats talking, now bits later, and data bits opinions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and 
I have one last thing. So I'm also an organizer of an SAP Insight Track. So this is the SAP Insight Track in Timisoara in the Romania. This is called, I recently learned that it's one of the cities which is called Little Vienna because it, uh, Timisoara was part of the Austrian Empire for a long time and it has a similar architecture. We had an event last year and we planned already one for next year and we have a date, it's April the 13th next year. Thank you. Thank you.